Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast, where we seek progress, not perfection. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. We're being hijacked today. We got, we got Rob Sivis, one of our favorite guys. He is the most downloaded guy on our, and the most downloaded episode by far on our podcast. So Tro and I are l- learning from the master here today. Hey Tro, how you doing, man? Look, so happy to be here. So excited. It's like even before we got started, we got these amazing nuggets. I'm like, oh, we got to get it all on air. We got to get it. So I'm so excited to have uh, Dr. Sivas here to tell us to just preach and, and have a discussion. Uh, this is this, you know, it's always a, a pleasure and an honor to, to hear you talk. Yeah. And, well, and anyone who much. hasn't heard it, episode number 10, it's it's gold. It's our most downloaded episode. I mean, it's awesome. And, and you know, we've had the honor of seeing Rob speak a few times. And, man, we're, we just sit there in awe. It's awesome. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks very much, Brian. Um, Dr. Sivas is my dad. I'm just Rob. Um, that's the first point. The second thing is if the last one was gold, let's make this one flat on him. All right, um, man. So what let's we do it. About, I, I wasn't – I followed Dr. Tro on Instagram, and I would strongly suggest uh, anybody listening to this does the same thing. A lot of pearls come out of there. But an interesting concept for me being in this field for a long time is that I get a lot of people that come – in fact, everybody that comes into my office walks in here – as experts at failing um, diet programs. They've all tried a bunch of things. They've all lost weight, but they've failed. And one of the primary reasons why we fail, especially when you consider the carbohydrate addiction model that is kind of my footprint, is that as long as you're doing a diet, there's an end point, there's a goal. You want to lose weight. Um, You want to modify your diabetes. And then what? Um, If you're doing this as a diet, what you're actually doing is depriving yourself of something you love to eat. And it's just a question of time before that deprivation is so tempting that you trip over your own feet and um, go back to eating carbohydrates. When you talk to a vegetarian, if you know anybody that's a vegetarian, they don't say they're on a vegetarian diet. They define themselves as that entity. In other words, vegetarianism and being a vegetarian is who they are. It is their lifestyle. It is their way of life. It is something that resonates with them. It's in their heads all the time. And as a, someone doing a ketogenic diet, it's just a little piece of you. If you become keto, if this is your way of life, if you don't eat carbohydrates and you can have arrogant integrity over the fact that that stuff is disgusting because it made me fat and sick, then you don't feel deprived. You're arrogant about the fact that you no longer eat that. A little bit like an ex-smoker who is arrogant about the fact that they no longer smoke. You're less likely to stumble and fall and relapse if you're arrogant and you are that person rather than if you're just doing this as a diet. It's got to be comprehensive. It's got to be pervasive. It has to be your way of life. It's in your head all the time. And what I said to Tro on the on the, um, uh, on the Instagram thing was, um, Dr. Tro isn't doing keto. He is Ketro. And that's where the sustainability comes from. And I just threw that out. So that is a critical concept that the keto diet evangelists don't quite grasp. Um, Because really, when you start giving yourself permission here and there to do things you shouldn't do, that's a very slippery slope. No different than someone who's not drinking versus I am an alcoholic. So I just want to bring that point up. But uh, Brian, I think if you'll give me permission, uh, I'm going to go down a slightly different road today. When I talk to my colleagues in the medical fields, and, and I think most patients are smart enough. In fact, uh, patients have to be smarter than their doctors these days to be able to keep themselves healthy. Um, but what I want to do is quantify and put into context some of the diseases that come from what we do to ourselves. So I'm going to give the, the little bit of an insulin talk. Uh, that a lot of people don't understand. I, I'll give you an example. Um, most people, when they look at an enormous patient, they, they look at someone who weighs four or 500 pounds, the first thing they think is that, oh my God, look how sick that person must be. And very often, the fattest people are actually the healthiest of the people that eat chronic excessive carbohydrates. And, and that doesn't compute. It doesn't resonate with most doctors. So let's unpack that a little bit. And 
perhaps the sickest person is your mildly overweight person who has diabetes or metabolic syndrome. And how does that work? Why is that the case? Why do some people become enormous and they aren't very sick? And why are some people overweight and awfully sick? So let's go down that road. And <clears throat> it starts with a little bit of biology and evolution. Evolutionarily, it takes at minimum 20 to 30 generations for genes to really change under environmental pressures. So if you look at our gen genome, at our, the genes that we human beings have, we're kind of still stuck in the late hunter-gatherer society. So if you look at the environment of the late hunter-gatherers, they were often shoreline people. They lived on shorelines where they had access to water, they had access to seafood, they had access to animals and plants that grew on the shoreline, first and foremost. Secondly, um, those people were hunter-gatherers. They were opportunists. They ate a lot of meat, they ate a lot of animals they could catch if they were successful, fish and animals. And they also had some plants available to them, but they didn't have cultivated crops. They really didn't see a lot of uh, um, high carbohydrate, uh, carbohydrate rich foods. Those occurred more and more as we became farmers. And then as we started to manufacture carbohydrates in the manufacturing era, but our genetics are still stuck in the hunter gather era. What does that mean? Well, from a genetic perspective, we really don't have uh, a lot of access in those days to carbohydrates. So therefore, the primary gene that governed our metabolism was a hormone or is a hormone called glucagon. It's not insulin. Everybody talks about insulin, insulin, insulin. The human body absolutely needs sugar. We have to have sugar in our bloodstream. And we have a very tight clamp of sugar between 70 and 100 millimoles per liter in this country. 70 to 100, and between insulin and glucagon, they keep the sugar clamped at that level. Now, sugar is vital for very few cells, but for example, our red blood cells, the support cells of our neurons called the Schwann cells, they require sugar. Our brain really doesn't require sugar. Nevertheless, we need sugar at least around 70. And the hormone that maintains our blood sugar at around 70 is glucagon. What glucagon does is it forces the liver to convert amino acids or protein and fat into sugar and maintains that blood sugar at that low level. As your blood sugar rises, that elevation in the blood sugar triggers insulin release from the pancreas and insulin's primary job is not to clear the sugar from the bloodstream, its primary job is to switch off glucagon. So insulin switches off glucagon, glucagon is our genetically based factory it's the factory hormone for sugar. The other thing that insulin does is insulin switches off the release of fat from the fat cells. So when your insulin levels are high, even though you may have some stored fat, your body doesn't release fat and have a high sugar level. That's counterintuitive. You've either got sugar or fat. And as your sugar level goes up, it switches off fat production. And then the one other hormone that we need to look at is a hormone called cortisol, which is our kind of fright and flight hormone. And cortisol triggers glucagon to release sugar into the bloodstream. So in the morning when I wake up, as I wake up, cortisol is being stimulated. It triggers glucagon for my liver to release sugar into my bloodstream. And my blood sugar goes up. We call that the dawn effect. When I'm putting my shoe, on my shoes to go for a run, cortisol, before I'm even running, cortisol triggers my glucagon to get the liver to release sugar. My sugar goes up before I even go for the run. That's biologically, if I come around a, a corner and there's a saber-toothed tiger, I need that sugar instantaneously in my bloodstream to try to run away, okay? So under normal circumstances, when we're not consuming sugar by mouth, our blood sugar is maintained by glucagon, and insulin's job is to control glucagon and fat release. Now, let's fast forward into the modern era where we're living a life of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. So now, instead of our blood sugar being at and around 70, our blood sugar is at and around 100. And we are now asking insulin to do a job it's not genetically designed to do. We're asking insulin to force the liver and other tissues to remove sugar from the bloodstream, to keep our blood sugar lower rather than just switching off glucagon. And that's all good and well. The sugar gets removed from the, from the bloodstream. And when insulin forces the liver to remove that sugar, the liver converts it to fat. So sugar becomes fat under the influence of insulin. But because the liver is seeing that insulin all the time, and it's not conditioned to do that, 
the liver says, screw you, I'm not going to react to you anymore. And instead of being sensitive to insulin, it starts resisting the effect of insulin. It's called insulin resistance. And as the liver becomes resistant to insulin, the pancreas now has two options. If the pancreas can produce more insulin, it says, screw you liver, here's more insulin, and it forces the liver to produce, to, to, to function harder, even though it's resistant, and to continue to convert sugar to fat. Some people genetically are high insulin producers. They can produce a lot of insulin. So no matter how resistant the liver is, the pancreas says, screw you liver, screw your insulin resistance, here's more insulin, do your damn job. And you convert sugar to fat, and those people become enormous. That's called an obesogenic pattern. But guess what? Their blood sugar remains fairly normal. It may be at the upper limit of normal or just a little higher, 100, 90, 95, 105, but it's pretty, it's pretty much within the normal range. It's not causing damage in the blood vessels. And because there's not an elevated sugar in the bloodstream, the hemoglobin A1C, which is really damaged to blood vessel, uh, to, to red blood cells in the blood vessels, is normal. So they can have a hemoglobin A1C of 5.5 or 5.6, upper limit of normal, and yet be massive and consuming huge amounts of sugar. That obesogenic uh, genetics protects them from the damage of sugar in their bloodstream. Now let's flip this across and look at a different genetic pattern. There are some people out there who are low insulin producers. Biologically, they, their, their pancreas doesn't have the genetics to produce a lot of insulin. So when they're eating all those carbohydrates, and their liver says, screw you, pancreas, I'm becoming resistant to your insulin. Ugh, the pancreas can't produce more insulin. And therefore, the liver no longer converts sugar to fat, and the sugar builds up in the bloodstream, and those sugar numbers go up and up and up. They start damaging the red blood cells. They start damaging the endothelial cells or the cells that line the blood vessels. And those people become diabetic. And that is the diabetogenic pattern of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. And the difference between the two is this, the diabetogenic pattern means that that sugar is very high in the liver, uh, sorry, in the, in the bloodstream, and the sugar in the bloodstream causes damage. Those are the people that are high, at high risk for strokes, for heart attacks, for going blind, for losing their kidneys, for erectile dysfunction, for their toes and their feet dropping off, the consequences of diabetes. The obesogenic people, those very fat people, have fairly normal blood sugars, their risk of a heart attack or a stroke is extremely low until they run out of the ability to produce more insulin. So we've got to, as doctors, be able to separate out by doing the blood work, the obesogenic from the diabetogenic people because they need different treatment. Okay? Now, the other part about the obesogenic, just to come full circle, the obesogenic people don't escape unscathed. Cholesterol. Everybody's malign cholesterol. Cholesterol is bad. In fact, cholesterol is one molecule and it's not bad. It is vitally necessary to human survival. About 30% of a healthy cell's membranes is made of cholesterol. To anchor protein is a channel, particularly in the brain. So cholesterol is vital. But the, the other thing that cholesterol does is cholesterol is a universal precursor. It is the starting molecule for steroid hormones. And there are six steroid hormones or steroid pathways that are very, very important to human biology. So you start out with cholesterol and then you go through a series of enzyme changes to that cholesterol molecule and that cholesterol backbone can be converted into estrogen in women, into testosterone in males, into cortisol, into human growth hormone, into thyroid hormone, into vitamin D3, which is not vitamin that you consume, that's D1. D3 is something called cholecalciferol, which is cholesterol being converted to vitamin D3. And cholesterol is also secreted in the bile as bile salts. And those bile salts are used to absorb vitamins A, D, E, K, the fat-soluble vitamins. So cholesterol has that vital role. Why am I talking about this? Because the very first stage of enzyme transformation of cholesterol to all those end organ hormones or endohormones is insulin. Insulin blocks that very first conversion of cholesterol to pregnenolone, which is one of those steps. And when you're a high insulin producer, it blocks steroid hormone production. So therefore, your high insulin producers, let's take a fertile woman. 
those are the people that get polycystic ovarian syndrome because they don't produce estrogen, they produce testosterone, and they almost never become diabetic. So when you're a gynecologist, some group of the, the low insulin producers will become, will develop gestational diabetes. They become pregnant, but then lose their babies. The uh, um, high insulin producers can't produce insulin. They have a more androgenic or male hormone production. They can't get pregnant. But once they're pregnant, they're usually pretty okay. And we don't distinguish between those two. Not even the gynecologists distinguish between those two. All these men running around with low testosterone, it's because their insulin levels are chronically high. Drop the insulin level, your testosterone comes back. It gets better. And I've shown that. I had a guy the other day who came in. A year ago, his testosterone was 34. A year after coming off carbohydrates, it's 107. And that's just coming off carbohydrates. But we don't associate that. Cortisol, growth hormone, test, uh, thyroid hormone, those are your anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, and tissue repair, tissue building hormones. Well, when people say, I'm flat, I've got no energy or I'm weak, or I'm getting colds all the time, or I'm inflamed all the time. That again, they typically are your high insulin producers. If people have got low vitamin D, it's not typically because they're not eating vitamin D. There's plenty of vitamin D in our food, but they're not producing and activating that vitamin D by combining it with cholecalciferol. And they're not absorbing the D because they're not eating fat. The ADEK is missing. So when you put this, the biology together, I don't need nutritional outcome studies that compare this group to that group in terms of outcomes to understand and to be able to predict with my patients what diseases I need to look for. I can measure the A1C, I can measure their triglycerides, I can measure their insulin and their C-peptide. And if I can measure those numbers, I can predict what diseases they're going to have. And yet we doctors don't understand that. They don't teach that at medical school. How many patients do you not have that come into your offices that are on thyroid hormone, but they don't have a diagnosis? In medical school, I was taught that when the thyroid malfunctions, there's a reason. You've got Graves' disease, you've got Hashimoto's, you've got a tumor, you're iodine deficient. Nobody comes in with those diagnoses. Nobody can make the diagnosis. But they do the blood test and their thyroid hormone is, level, is low. And what do they do? They put them on Synthroid or Alma thyroid. But they don't know why the hell they've got it, because nobody talks about insulogenic hypothyroidism. And it's the commonest disease. Over 70 patients that come into my office, especially the women, are on thyroid hormone. Or they're on vitamin D. And guess what? Their vitamin D levels are still low. And yet they're taking 50,000 units of, high, of vitamin D a week. And they're on these massive guys that are on testosterone that cause all these problems. But their own testosterone is in the toilet. We doctors have become therapists we treat numbers we no longer understand biologic process and therefore we cannot help people to understand what they are doing to themselves in terms of damage and health and until we return back to di to become diagnosticians rather than therapists treating numbers americans and the people we serve are going to become sicker and sicker and sicker and there's nothing worse for a doctor to see their patients become sicker and be disempowered to be able to do anything about it. That leads to physician burnout. It leads to the distressed physician. I've been there. And all we hear about in our society is burnt out physicians. Well, hell, you can't help your patients anymore because you don't understand the biology. That's my ramble. Oh, no, I 100% I, I agree. You're preaching to the choir now. You know, I, we, I train medical students and... Uh, and residents and frequently you know as you know they'll be sitting down they'll be diligently you know talking with the patient and they'll go write a note and their subjective portion of the note the part that says what the patient said their you know objective part you know part of the note the the part where they're uh talking about how the patient's physical exam appeared you know, these parts are so lengthy and all the labs are listed, you know, all nice and neatly. And then you finally get to an assessment and a plan and they write, you know, hypothyroidism, replete thyroid hormone. And so everything you're saying is exactly right. And the message I tell them is, no, 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 you are paid to think. Okay. You are paid to think, why is this happening? What is the cause? What can be done? You know, you are not you just do not follow the person in front of you and do what they do. 
You know, for example, even to this day on radiographic images, they call the initial read a wet read. There has not been a digital, you know, there's been digital films in radiography for over 20 years. Yet every medical student is saying, oh, the wet read showed, you know, so and such and such on an x-ray. And I ask them, well, what is a wet read? And they say, oh, to, you know, it's the initial read. Well, what, why are you saying that? Why are you calling it a wet read? Well, because that's what the attending before me said it was. It's a wet read, you know? And I said, well, why do they call it that? And they don't know. And here the medical students are saying things that they don't know and repeating things they don't know because their mentors say them and they repeat them. And it's called a wet read just for everybody to know because 30 years ago when you had to take the film and actually put it in, you know, in the dark room and you had to put it into the, the chemicals and you had to, you know, take the film and, you know, a, you know, take all the, 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 let all the fluid come off and hang it against the light and see what that radiograph, that x-ray showed, right? That was why they called it a wet read. But we've had digital x-rays for the last 20 years and the medical students are calling it wet reads. So what, what we're doing is the problem in medical education right now, what you're talking about is we do not train diagnosticians. We train lemmings to follow guidelines and they're not thinking. Sorry. You're, you're absolutely right. And I think it, it goes a little deeper since we're on that topic. Let's segue there is that when I was trained as a doctor, I was, I was trained in biology and pathophysiology and anatomy. Those were the core concepts that we were trained with. And the most important thing that I learned, was to always ask the question, why? Why is this disease process happening? Let me walk it back and look at the biology behind it. The problem with healthcare is that we doctors, particularly in America, 20, 30, 40 years ago, abused healthcare. We raped and pillaged it and we made a lot of money from it. And I understand that and I, it's not a good thing to say to us. But when people looked at the power that doctors had, when I first came to this country in 1989, doctors had massive power over healthcare. And we were doing a good job, but not an effective job. At the same time, in the business world, huge conglomerates were being broken down. So you had these big, uh, the baby bells, and all these massive companies in the business world were being fractured into smaller and smaller companies that could put checks and balances on each other to get rid of the greed of these big corporations. And to a certain extent, we doctors abuse that ourselves. So what they did with, with business is they turned it into a systems function. And they created algorithms where systems interact with each other, almost like if you look at your watch, the cogs on the wheel. And the different cogs control each other, and all the cogs have to work together to, to count the time, to, to function that, that, that system. And that's the way business worked, and it's worked very well for business. It's been able to control that. They then applied the same systems approach to healthcare. So they destroyed the pyramid where doctors were at the top and in control, and they brought in layers of administrators. And doctors have, have forced to become cogs in the wheel, as have nurse practitioners and, and, and uh, nurses and administrators. And everybody now is on the same playing field, and we've become cogs in the wheel. Well, the metrics have changed as well. Under those circumstances, when a nurse practitioner and a doctor and a physician's assistant are kind of equivalent in terms of the healthcare they provide, which is wonderful, we have to have guidelines. And the guidelines have become a numbers approach. And pharmaceutical companies have, have fed into this as well. So that it's called best practices. It's called standard of care. It's called guidelines. And it is done to suit a system approach to healthcare. But we've take, taken individualization, we've taken the question why, and we've removed it. And we've become uh, people who react to numbers. I don't call myself a doctor in this country. I call myself a practitioner. I practice best practices as they are taught to me by society and societies and guidelines. So we're following guidelines. If, you're, if your thyroid hormone is low, you treat with this. That's the guideline. And whether I'm a doctor or a nurse practitioner, it's the same principle. If your blood pressure is this, here's the algorithm of medications we put you on. If your cholesterol is this, your LDL cholesterol is this, this is when you start your statin. If you've got diabetes, these are the medications you treat. And we've become a, we've developed a systems approach to healthcare that has taken doctors out 
of controlling health. And, and while it, it had value because we abused the system, it is the pendulum has swung so far toward the economics and toward deregulation or, or regulation, not deregulation, systems regulation, that they've taken the autonomy of thinking, the autonomy of biology and biological and pathophysiologic thinking out of healthcare. And that's why we're struggling, particularly with the advent of diseases that we cause to ourselves. So we're not able to think. And, and I'll give you a perfectly plausible way. Let's, let's segue to something else. And, and I guess just the last comment about that is the three of us still cling desperately to the mechanics of how the human body works and treat based on physiology, pathophysiology, and biology rather than treat numbers. And but psychology, really right, Rob? And psychology, Sorry? you look and you're like, hey, you're Absolutely going through divorce, psychology. you got all this stuff going on in life. Here, let me give you a blood. As a matter of fact, I just got a call today. A lady's son died and her blood pressure spikes, <laughs> you know, going through depression, anxiety, all this kind of stuff. And they're like, oh my gosh, her blood, it's, it's been fine all this time. Her, she finds out her son died and her blood pressure goes high and they're freaking out. They go, how many drugs are we, we had to do something. It's like, okay, she's under major stress right now. Stress, hormones, insulin spikes, all this stuff's going on. So, you know, let's just, keep an eye on it and, 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 you know, help her out a little bit. Let's work on her emotional aspects. But medicine, what we've done is we look at our watch and say, okay, I got 15 minutes with you. You got hypertension, you got diabetes, you're depressed and you have heartburn. So I go, okay, I got a pill for this, pill for that. Pill. Okay, see you next patient, right? We've got to that point because how long is it going to take us to explain this physiology? That's why I love the podcast to have someone like you come on and say, okay, look, this is not the way it works. It's not that you have a, a pill deficiency you got a lot of other pathology going on causing this problem right until we till we make that clear in medicine because i'm telling you i get notes i get notices every day says look this patient's diabetic they're not on an ace inhibitor not on a statin drug well their a1c has been 5.2 for the last year right their blood pressure is normal and their cholesterol is outstanding now why is it that every week i'm getting a letter from you guys saying they need all these drugs right we we took because care of the they, underlying they had cost. the label of diabetes attached to them way back and it's inconceivable to the system that you can fix diabetes. So once in your history from 20 years ago, you've got that label, you're always that person. And as you well know, the American Heart Association says, if you're diabetic and your, your LDL is above 70, you need to be on a statin if you're between 40 and 70. I got that notification yesterday. And my patient's A1C is 5.1. As you said, it used to be 7. It's 5.1. But they're telling me I need to treat her with a statin. So let's go down the statin pathway because this is such an important thing. It's such a commonly prescribed drug. And, you know, everybody's looking at, oh, statins don't work or this system or that. You know, it's very simple. It's a, it's a very, very simple concept to understand. Okay. And the question is, does LDL cause damage? If you believe that LDL directly causes damage, and that damage will lead to a heart attack or stroke. Absolutely, put your patient on a statin. Because then, getting rid of the cause of the damage, which is LDL, is going to fix the problem or reduce the problem. However, the issue with that is that, despite plenty of studies, nobody has ever shown me a study demonstrating how LDL damages blood vessels. There's no evidence. So we've got to go to all these outcomes measurements that can be so distorted because we have no biological evidence that LDL causes injury. I, however, and it's not just me personally, but my PhD was on this, have absolute proof of what causes the injury. So if you have proof of something else, if you've got biological evidence that something else causes an injury to a blood vessel, and maybe LDL is trying to fix that injury, then maybe LDL is not the bad thing, not causing the problem. Maybe it's solving the problem. If, if you look at your, where you live, where anybody lives, and you see 50 uh, fire trucks going past your house, does that mean your house is on fire? No, it doesn't. It means there's a fire somewhere or the trucks are just moving from one station to another. But if your house is on fire, you want those fire trucks there. The fire trucks didn't cause the problem. They didn't cause the fire. They're there to put it out. But if you look down, you see a bunch of fire trucks outside a house, you might think that they're causing the fire. 
The LDL is a patch. It's trying to heal the injury. And in my PhD, it was a very simple study that we did. We took livers. We, we harvested livers from animals, and we did this in humans as well. And we isolated those livers, and we infused into the liver different concentrations of sugar. And in a dose-response way, that sugar specifically caused an injury to the cells, the endothelial cells that line blood vessels. We then started adding back different elements of what's called the clotting cascade, the things that cause clots to heal or to plug up those holes. And as we introduced the clotting factors, what we found is the sugar, in a dose-response way, injures the endothelial cells, causes them to swell up and leave little gaps. And what comes along when you've got that clotting cascade is at those gaps, you get little clots forming. And at first, it's a fibrin clot, and then you get platelets going into that clot, and the platelets become activated by the clotting cascade, and they attract white blood cells. So now you're getting white blood cells going into the clot, and the white blood cells, particularly the neutrophils and the lymphocytes, attract a molecule called ApoB, which is a protein in LDL, and the ApoB sticks to that clot. Now, if along comes your thrombolytics, they die, they, they dissolve the clot and your endothelial cell heals up. So the clot goes away. If, however, your blood sugar stays high, that injury remains, the fat gets into that clot, it stabilizes the clot, and what's part of that closing cascade is calcium. So now you've got calcium coming into the so-called plaque and you've got a calcified lipid plaque. But it's a response. That's If I punch a hole in the wall, that's sugar. You come along with some spackle and you try to heal that, that uh, 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 seal up that, that um, hole, that's LDL. And then I come along and I smash another hole in, so you put more spackle on and more spackle on, and eventually that spackle becomes a thicker and thicker layer. That's your atheroma. That's your plaque. But the, the LDL didn't cause the damage. In fact, LDL is necessary to heal the damage. So under those conditions, if you then put that person on a statin that gets rid of the, uh, that blocks the LDL formation, you're actually preventing the fireman from going to the fire. So not only are you not improving anything, you might even be making matters worse. And the two hormones, or sorry, the two things, the two drugs that cause that hole, that cause the injury in our society, it's not difficult to understand. Sugar, glucose, and nicotine. Nicotine causes an identical injury to endothelial cells. And whether that nicotine goes in a smoke or as, as a cigarette, as, to, as chewing tobacco, or as vaping, oh, vaping safer than smoking, the, the tobacco companies will tell you. Bullshit, it's not. Because nicotine causes the endothelial injury. Yes, smoking is a little bit worse than vaping, but it's the nicotine that's the problem. As long as it's going in, it doesn't matter if it's an apple or a donut, the sugar is the same that's entering your bloodstream and it's causing damage. Your LDL is the patch that's trying to heal the injury. But getting rid of the LDL is not gonna fix the problem. It's not gonna reduce your heart attack risk. It's getting rid of the, of the substance that's causing the injury, which is the nicotine and the sugar. You get rid of the nicotine and the sugar, you don't have an injury. Then it doesn't matter how much LDL you've got. Does that make sense? So statins are treating, they're killing the firemen instead of putting the fire out. So it really comes down to you as a doctor, where you believe that LDL causes problems or that LDL is trying to solve the problem. And if you believe, not believe, if you see the evidence that we have, and there's a mountain of evidence, that LDL is trying to fix the problem, you're not going to prescribe a statin under very few circumstances. But if you believe that LDL is causing the problem, sure, everybody should be on a statin. And that's the problem we have. Forget about outcomes. Forget about anything else. It's that concept of belief of injury that is crucial to whether you buy into statins or not. Rob, what's your feeling about uh, statins bumping up the nitric oxide, maybe having some protective uh, effect on the endothelium? And, and I think, again, looking at it, the way I look at it, and I may be incorrect, but I'd love to hear your talk on this. Um, looking at when you have a lot of sugar and insulin floating around, your large, fluffy LDL that don't cause damage, 
uh, are getting oxidized into the small dents that are associated with more damage? Maybe they just get into the endothelium better. Is that what you're saying? Because Right. So it's the ApoB, we believe that it's the ApoB that causes uh, um, the sticking of the LDL to the clot. Remember, it doesn't, the LDL does not cause the injury. So what happens is the ApoB is the molecule that easily inserts into that clot and sticks there. It can't be removed. HDL is actually where you're removing that stuff. So when the clot lyses, your HDL is actually the removal of that clot from the plaque. I'm simplifying it, but HDL removes fat from the plaque, whereas LDL is depositing it. And it's because of the ApoB and the ApoA, the, the actual lipoprotein that's causing the sticking. However, remember that what you're talking about is nitric oxide. Those are inflammatory markers. They're pro and anti-inflammatory. They, they're about inflammation. And it's the, the clotting cascade is a pro-inflammatory cascade. So there's nitric oxide involved. So no, the LDL doesn't, doesn't quiet the nitric oxide because it doesn't need to be there if you don't have that injury. If there's no injury, it's just the LDL is just transporting fat. And, and really, what is LDL? LDL is a transport molecule. It's a barge that transports fat from fat cells to tissues so that it can be used as fuel. It delivers the fat to the, to the area of injury because of the ApoB attraction affinity to that, to that clotting plaque. Does that, does that make sense? But if you don't have the injury, it's just a transport barge. Uh, let's say it's, it's transporting concrete from the factory to the building. But if there's a hole in the road, then maybe it stops and it dumps some concrete to fill the hole in the road. That's the way it works. No holes in the road, but the concrete doesn't cause the hole in the road. It's something else that causes the hole. So if there's no holes in the road, the concrete just goes back and forth from the building to the factory. And that's how LDL works. Now, how do you measure indirectly the injury? Well, when you're eating a lot of sugar that causes the injury, typically your triglycerides go up and your HDL goes down because you're not able to remove that, that plaque because the injuries continue. So HDL is low. And a lot of that sugar gets converted to triglycerides that goes kind of free bonded to globulin in the, in the bloodstream. So that's a measure, an indirect measure. The ratio of triglyceride and HDL is an indirect measure of the injurious agent, the sugar, because your body's desperately trying to get rid of that sugar. But in the diabesogenic people, it can't do that. So it's making some triglyceride, but ultimately it's the injury that's happening. In the fattest people, they can make a ton of triglycerides and typically their insulin's in their blood sugar. The insulin's gonna be very high, but their blood sugars are gonna be fairly normal. And that's what we don't understand. It's not one number. It's the interplay of all those numbers that matter. So if you're a patient or if you're a doctor, you damn well sure should be checking your insulin levels because you can't make treatment decisions without knowing what all the numbers are. You cannot put someone on a statin, even if you believe it's causing an injury, if you don't know what the triglycerides and the HDL are. Ivor Cummings does a great uh, uh, talk on that, and he's not even a doctor, okay? You've got to take those other things into consideration, even if you believe LDL is causing damage. Yeah, you know, Ivor was nice enough to let me borrow a couple of his slides, and it's super impressive when you look. They were showing high LDL, no, no risk difference. High total cholesterol, no risk difference. Hypertension doubles risk. A, uh, high A1C, high insulin level, seven times risk, right? And we're all looking at the thing that isn't, causing a, a, a risk change. We, and these are in men in Colombia who had heart attacks in the hospital and they're comparing them to the general population. They go, look, insulin is the problem, but no one, how many people out there listening have had their insulin checked? You know, very rare until two years ago, I never checked it once. They said, look, just look at the A1C, but the A1C doesn't give you the whole picture, right? It's very important. Right. Just like the LDL doesn't give you the whole picture. LDL tells you one thing, but if I see the high triglycerides and low HDL, I think, uh oh, this is not good, right? I don't, I haven't even looked at the LDL yet and I get nervous. Tro, are you seeing the same thing? You know, basically, I, I put out a tweet not too long ago, you know, I don't know, four or five years ago, Amy Berger, you know, challenged me, said, yo, you should consider a craft test. And I was like, what am I going to do? You know, the A1C is going to guide my treatment. You know, this is the way we train our medical students. The A1C is the number, you treat the number, right? And then you dive into this rabbit hole of, hey, wait, how exactly does the pathophysiology happen? You know, what is the natural course of diabetes? And you see kind of a, there was an excellent study in Japanese workers, about 40,000 of them, what the glucose, the insulin looked like prior to a diagnosis of diabetes. And you see this fasting insulin that, that slowly creeps up, 
over a number of years, starting nine years before diagnosis. And you see a fasting sugar that, you know, fasting blood glucose that slowly creeps up. And then what happens is the insulin doesn't spike up. It just continues to creep, creeps up, but then you get an insulin resistance at some point and the blood sugar skyrockets. You know, it goes from being like 100, 100, and then it just can't, you know, insulin is not having that same effect. And then one year before diagnosis, you see this massive spike in glucose. So, and then, well, let's juxtapose that to what happens at the end of disease. When you have diabetes, you know, 10 years in, now your insulin's like, your pancreas is just tired from redlining year after year. And now the insulin level drops. So, you know, the problem with insulin is that these, you know, medical uh, you know, epidemiolo epidemiologists look at an insulin level and they say, well, we don't know what to do with it. We don't know if it's high or low. It doesn't tell us anything about disease. Well, they'll no, it actually does. There's a story there, right? There's a story that the insulin level slowly creeped up. And then after years of being abused, that pancreas just gave up, right? So I think that we're not, you look, we're not, we weren't taught this. We weren't taught this. You have to have a love of learning to find this. And they've stamped out the love of learning for most doctors. Troy, let me jump in for a second. I, I hear what you're saying. I'm going to refine what you said a little bit. A normal insulin is four or below. Okay, I'm just throwing that number out there. If your insulin is above four, irrespective of what your blood sugar is, you're insulin resistant. In other words, the reason the insulin goes, the fasting insulin goes above four is because you're consuming carbohydrates that an insulin level of four cannot get the liver to remove. And so insulin resistance starts when, you're, when your insulin is measurable, when your insulin goes above four. And then genetically, your pancreas can produce a certain amount of insulin at peak production capacity. So... As your liver becomes more and more resistant, your insulin level goes up and up and up to overcome insulin resistance. But at some point, your pancreas can no longer produce insulin. I've seen people that can produce, my personal top insulin production in my own life is about 16, 15, 16. I can't produce more insulin than that. I saw a patient this morning whose insulin was 78, but her blood sugar was, I think, 80, 85. Okay, so she had a massive insulin production capacity. She's almost never going to become diabetic. If I continue to eat a lot of carbohydrates and keep my insulin at 16, 17, at some stage, my liver is no longer going to respond to that. And that's when I become diabetic. So the numbers I use is an insulin number at four or below is insulin sensitive. And why is that important? Because that's the goal for, of treatment for my patients. When my patients come with carbohydrates, I know they're becoming insulin sensitive when the insulins are four or below. I also use 1.5 to two units of insulin uh, in the bloodstream as my diagnosis for type one diabetes. Um, and also there's something called LADA, which is the, the um, autoimmune diabetes of adulthood, which may show you lower insulin levels. Those are people beginning to develop autoimmune diabetes, type one diabetes as adults. So you, you want to be aware of LADA as well. But having said all of that, um, your treatment goal is to get people's insulin below four. And when that happens, that means that they're able to remove the sugar from the bloodstream very quickly, or, or their liver is returning that insulin sensitivity. And slowly over time, as your red blood cells uh, die off and get replaced, your A1C will come down. But A1C is a very, very delayed measure of treatment. Your insulin is a much, much better measure of that. So um, you know, same thing with an A1C. A normal A1C is not below 5.7 or 6.5. A normal insulin is about 4.8 to 4.9 to 5.1. That's normal range where it's not damaging the, the red blood cells. Above 5.1, if your A1C is above 5.1, you are insulin resistant. Your level of blood sugar is chronically elevated to the point that it's starting to cause measurable damage to your body. What's happening elsewhere in the body? And we don't understand that. You know, we think of a normal blood pressure as being 120 over 80. It isn't. My blood pressure as I'm sitting here is 110 over 60. 120 over 80 is a carbophilic hypertension. In other words, the majority of essential hypertension that we deal with is where sugar is causing an increase in, in, in blood volume. It's causing the endothelial cells to swell to narrow the vessels. And that is the mechanism of carbohydrate-based hypertension. Essential hypertension is a very, very rare disorder. But 
if we can't find one of the common reasons of kidney damage or something like that for blood pressure, we say it's essential because we don't understand that it's because of the carbohydrates the guy's putting in his face. How many patients do you not see that are, that are off carbohydrates that are on an ultra low carbohydrate diet that have very low blood pressure and heart rates in the 50s? Well, when my patients go to their cardiologist, their cardiologists want to put a damn pacemaker in them because their heart rate's 48, 49, 50. But they're normal. We don't know what normal is because all of normal measurements come from the standard American diet, which is high in carbohydrates. So again, we have to, as doctors, beyond my lifetime, we're going to have to rethink what normal is because normal is based on carbohydrate consumption. And well, that's also, not normal. Also, Rob, when you look at the guidelines, looking at Ivers graphs too, looking at your A1C, at seven, it's a total disaster from a cardiovascular standpoint. Why? Because of exactly what you're talking about, damage to the endothelium, right? So the American Diabetes Association says, well, get the A1C less than seven, you're at goal. Guess what? You're, at a sit, you're a sitting duck. When you look at those graphs, I show them to my patients now and say, you know what? If your A1C is sitting at seven, here's your cardiovascular risk, you know, four times higher than it was in, in, at, at five. You, know, you go up one point and it's a huge uh, 400% increase, right? So it's a, it's a scary thing because our guidelines are so wrong because they're looking at medical management with insulin, right? They're saying, hey, look, it's the insulin, all these, these fluid shifts and, and sugar going up and down, causing damage to endothelium. You know, I think that that's part of it also. But yeah, we're, we're in trouble if we use these guidelines that we're given and we're considered that as a normal, good control. They're well controlled. Their A1C is seven. And we're thinking that's not well controlled. You and I think differently because your studies and things that I've seen too. And you go, oh, oh, this is not good. You got to get it down. And people kind of think, well, I can have extra cookies tonight because my A1C is 6.8. You know what I mean? Right. But you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, one of the other things that I'll throw out there, and I know I'm pretty radical in my thinking, I'm going to say this. The word diabetes is irrelevant because you make the diagnosis of diabetes at an A1C of 6.5, which is the number at which we start medication. Diabetes, the diagnosis of diabetes is irrelevant. And we've got to stop thinking about diabetes as a diagnosis when it comes to type 2. It applies to type 1s. What is relevant is insulin resistance. And we start measuring insulin resistance when your, when your insulin level starts going above 4 units. A1C is a measure of damage to the human body by sugar. And if it's above 5.1 or 5.2, that damage is happening. And they only start treating it at 6.5. So exactly to your point, if 5.1 is normal and 6.5 is treatment, what the hell is happening between that? And it takes years of damage to get it up to 6.5. And then what's even more bizarre is the, the ADA, the American Diabetes Association's treatment goal is an A1C below 7, which is higher than the damn diagnostic point. How does that work? So we really have to stop thinking about diabetes and start thinking about insulin resistance as the disease. And we need to treat insulin resistance through behavioral modification and possibly even through medication such as metformin, which increases insulin sensitivity, rather than treating diabetes. The because problem, we're not treating disease when we're treating diabetes. The, the problem is, yeah, absolutely makes sense. The problem is this, is that our guidelines are based off pharmacotherapy. That's the problem. That's why it's, you know, an A1C of seven, you treat and, you know, it's really based off pharmacotherapy. Who, somebody drew a line in the sand for A1C of seven. You know, damage starts, as you said, between five and 5.5, 5, right? right. So, so really the disease is happening much earlier. The process is happening years before and we're missing it and we're completely missing it. And we're just playing, we're just playing catch up with Band-Aids. You know, we're waiting for it to get to seven so we can give a medication. And, you know, the reason why they treat an A1C of seven or seven and a half is because the drugs are so damn terrible. You know, the, yes. the drugs besides metformin, the sulfonylureas, all these other, all these drugs, that you know, they're so damn terrible. And well, and I steal all Rob's sayings here, Rob. We use your sayings all the time here. It's like, like your, your analogy with the factory of saying, hey, look, you keep polluting the river. You're going to hire more and more people to clean the river constantly. You're never going to keep up or you shut the factory down. You know, patients right. get that, you know, your turn, you and Jason Fung, I, I quote you guys all the time because it's very helpful when he's talking about the liver being like a suitcase is totally full of clothes and you can't put your wife's shoes in there. Now you got to empty the suitcase at some point, either fasting, either cutting your carbs. And, and your study, Rob, the first, when I first met you, I thought this guy's full of it. Cause you go, look, 
we resolve fatty liver disease or at least put it into remission in, in seven days, right? Five days of keto. 72 hours, three days. Well, in, in three days you can, right? I mean, geez. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and so it's so frustrating for me as uh, understanding what I know and understanding the physiology because you and I have talked a lot about this stuff. Yesterday, a vegan doctor comes on and goes, oh, yeah, it's, the, it's never been the sugar causing diabetes. It's the fat. They're eating too much fat. Blood. I'm like, how come all my people are going on a high fat diet or, a, or not, I'm not putting them on a high fat diet necessarily, but they're cutting their carbs and their, their sugars are dropping. I mean, I, you and I have CGMs. We look at them, continuous glucose monitors, and you see it. You go, hey, I put on my running shoes, my sugar spike, right? If I get stressed or I have to give a talk, my sugar spike, right? Your body is wanting to survive. That's what it's supposed and to be. That's it's called not normal, a good or bad thing. right? Yeah. It's that's not a good normal. or bad thing. It's what it does. That's just the reality. I work out hard. My sugars go up, right? Except today. I did, I did Ben Bikikio's workout and my sugars actually stayed, you know, they, they stay stable when I do that workout because of the, the glycogen, you know? So anyways, we'll, we'll talk about that. We have a lot of stuff because one of the things that Tro and I have come across too is some people, I have a guy who's 140 pounds, A1C is always high, his insulin level is like 1.5, you know, lean, uh, I was thinking, gosh, darn it. We're trying everything to try to make him insulin sensitive. Get him to do Ben's workout. And he drops his A1C down to six, from 7.2 to six with exercise, right? Twice a week doing his workout, muscle, putting on muscle, making his body more. Because all you can do, if you, if you don't make a lot of insulin, you got to make your body more sensitive to insulin, I think. Absolutely. And yeah, that's what Ben's saying. I have, if you're telling me his insulin is 1.5, I'd be worried that he has early one, early type one diabetes. That's a low, low insulin number. And, but but here's, let's just go into that for a second. You know, the poor type 1 diabetics, number one, they're, they're dealing with a disease that is lifelong. But number two is they're so confused about how to treat it. And you don't treat type 1 diabetes with a glycemic index. The only difference between a type 1 diabetic and me is where the insulin comes from. In me, it comes from my pancreas. In a type 1 diabetic, it comes from a needle whether it's a glucose, whether it's an insulin pump or a needle. And the single worst thing you can do to, an, to a type 1 diabetic is to deprive them of continuous glucose monitoring. Because what they want to do, just like my body does, I have sensors, I have a CGM built into my body. God or nature gave it to me. And my CGM says, my blood sugar is this, and my pancreas says, here's a little bit of insulin for you. Or my blood sugar is this, here's a little bit of glucagon for you. That's how my body works. Why can we not duplicate that for a type 1? Type 1 diabetics should be completely healthy and normal. It is the type 2 component. It is the insulin resistance that harms type 1 diabetics. When they're eating all that sugar, just like, with, just like I would, my body becomes resistant to, to, to uh, carbohydrates when they're chronically in my bloodstream. So with type 1, the injected insulin, your body becomes resistant to that insulin you're injecting. And then you need more and more insulin. And eventually you get to a point where there's paradoxical gluconeogenesis, even when your blood sugar is high, you stop reacting to your own insulin. That is a type 1 diabetic's nightmare when their insulin doesn't work anymore. And I see a lot of type 1s where that has happened. And it's an awful situation. But the coolest part is you get them off carbohydrates, the insulin sensitivity comes back, and they get better almost immediately. It's so quick. So type one should have a completely normal A1C if they don't eat carbohydrates. A type one has the same risk profile that I have if we don't eat carbohydrates. Dr. Bernstein has done a great job of educating diabetics. He's diabetic himself. In fact, he went from being an engineer to a doctor to be able to explain this and help other people. Dr. Richard K. Bernstein. Now, we're well beyond Bernstein. He he's like Atkins. He started out with this great idea, fundamentally changed thinking, and yet nobody adopted what he's doing. Same thing with Atkins. This wonderful guy who nobody's adopted. Be that as it may, we're well beyond Atkins, and we're well beyond Bernstein, but they are the four forefathers. They are the Nobel laureates after I'm old and dead, I believe. Those two guys have worked very, very hard at, our, at changing our fundamental understanding of these diseases. But type 1s do not have to have any lower life quality or life risk than a normal person, as long as they're okay giving themselves insulin, but they have to monitor it. Get a damn insulin pump, at least uh, get a darn CGM for yourself. You know how difficult it is to get, an uh, to get a CGM for patients? It is incredibly difficult. 
Yeah. I'm, I, I oh, write we, we so many justification letters all the time. And every three months, I have to up the justification letters, up the justification letters. And, and the problem is when they start getting better, when they go on a ketogenic diet and their blood sugars get better, they deny them the CGM because you're, you're not testing your blood sugar. This, it is sorry I, I get upset well get you know Rob hey I had two diabetes educators come to me as patients and they were saying how crazy keto is I said look I'm writing you both a prescription it's a hundred bucks go get it right they, they put on CGMs you know they work at my hospital and they're like holy both of them emailed me said oh my gosh this is crazy my sugars are it's unbelievable they, they were shocked they had no idea they weren't checking their sugars they had no idea they go what do we tell people now right? When you see it, you can't unsee what you've seen. Like seeing how our bodies respond. You le I've learned a ton by having the CGM, right? And I'm a doc studying this stuff all the time. So when you start realizing, wow, I've been wrong a bunch of times. You know, I thought when I worked out really hard, my sugars would drop. My glycogen is going to be depleted and my muscles are going to... Not true. It, it spikes like crazy. If you do a super intense workout, it spikes. So why are we carb loading for exercise, right? Why are we... You know, we these things that we just have were told and, and you know you and jason and a lot of people out there saying that ah, bs not true that's what we were told but it's not true look at the data right when you start looking at the data when you have someone that has does metabolic testing and it says hey you fast for three days and your metabolic rate goes up when you're in a ketogenic state does that mean if i skip breakfast it's going to drop all of a sudden i mean all this stuff they said like if you skip one meal your whole body is going to shut down we're all smart of now we know hey if i don't eat all day my sugars actually start creeping up towards the end of the day right? When I eat, it drops because now it has energy. It doesn't have to start kicking out my glycogen stores anymore. So all those kind of things, we're learning so much. So the old, the old guard is going to have a lot of trouble, you know, because I called out the, the vegan guy. I go, look, go eat a bunch of orange juice and, and, and have a pastry. And you tell me your sugars don't spike. It doesn't, it just makes zero sense or have something that's just pure sugar with no fat in it. It's not the fat causing the problem. And we have to come to terms with that, you know? So I think having more tools, more weapons, we're starting to learn and having common sense and having studies like your studies and studies that, that Tro is doing. And, and all of us are, are, are having these anecdotal cases that are just unbelievable that if I heard it three years ago, I'd say it's, it's garbage. They're, they're, these guys are making it up, right? When you see it and it's, it's hard to imagine from a mood standpoint, from a depression standpoint, from schizophrenia standpoint, all this stuff we're seeing, you go, gosh, how much is our diet affecting our society right now? Well, you're absolutely right. And you know, one of the interesting things, things I said is that we've moved beyond Atkins, we've moved beyond Bernstein. There are interesting trends, even for myself who's been in the trenches for a long, long time. There are new things coming around all the time. And what's very interesting is what Jason's doing with the intermittent fasting stuff. And I really don't like that term. I think the problem with us is we've been, we've been educated or misled to intermittent eating. And when we're eating a lot of carbohydrates, our blood sugars are going up and down based on what we put in our face, and it forces us to snack every time our blood sugars go down. As you level that off by being in ketosis, you don't feel hungry, and it's okay to eat once or twice a day. I don't call that, I don't call eating once or twice a day intermittent fasting. I call that normal. Um, and, and I think we've, but we've, we've gotten so far away from normal that it's now something called fasting, which is kind of a horrible word. I do think that intermittent starvation can be problematic when you start using your own muscles as a source of energy, but that's a very delayed response. So intermittent fasting is this wonderful concept that I just wish we could come up with a better name for it than fasting, but it just means not eating. It means tapping into your stores and then replenishing them from time to time. So it's an ebb and flow. The other, so the, but that's been a huge forward movement um, even within the ketogenic uh, group of people. It's been a wonderful thing since about 2012-13 that, that Jason has brought about. The other thing that I am becoming more and more comfortable with, and I had some discomfort with it, um, is looking at which food group contains no carbohydrates. Which food group contains no carb or very, very few carbohydrates? Yeah, meat. Uh, animals. Yeah, animals. meat. So, you know, the early on, we really said, okay, it's okay to eat a lot of animals, but you've got a nose to tail them. You've got to eat the organs. You've got to eat all that stuff. And guys like Sean Baker and Zach Bitter and, and some of the carnivores, I call them the experiment. I love Sean. He's nuts, but I love him to bits. But they are the experiment. And they're proving to us that it is healthy and okay to eat animal products. And in fact, the studies, the studies that came out last week um, that said, actually, there's no, from the people that didn't believe this, that failed to find evidence that meat causes significant harm. 
that's a big deal. They're not yet willing to say that it's okay to eat meat, but they were brave enough to say, oh, actually, we couldn't find any evidence that meat's bad for us. And that's a big deal. And then you've got guys like Sean and myself and others who are doing the experiment on ourselves where eating meat is not only not bad, it actually is incredibly powerfully healthy. I was concerned about the micronutrients. And uh, I check that on myself on a regular basis. Guess what? My micronutrients on pretty much mostly a carnivore diet is significantly better than it was on a mixed omnivorous diet. And I was talking to someone or emailing with someone called Amber O'Hearn, who's also part of the low-carb movement. And she was saying that, I don't know if you know Amber at all, but biologically, <laughs> the human enzymatic GI tract lends itself to being meat-based or animal-based. It doesn't do as well as it could. It survives on an omnivorous diet, but it's better suited to an enzymatic meat-based diet or animal-based diet. So while there is room for a vegetarian re for vegetarianism from a, uh, an ethical and a religious perspective, that's as far to the vegetarian side as I think is healthy. Veganism is a diet of malnutrition. And for a while, veganism, if you're willing to ignore uh, uh, um, malnutrition as a disease, veganism is a healthy way to lose weight or get control of your diabetes for a short period of time. Because the body inherently has a number of built-up stores of certain minerals and vitamins, particularly your ADEKs and that kind of thing. But if you continue that long term, you will become malnourished. And that's my concern. And we see that in our bariatric patients, particularly the metabolic bariatric surgery patients, where they become malnourished because they're not getting in adequate quantities of the right stuff. For the first couple of years, they're fine. But down the road, they start getting these subtle diseases that are very difficult to measure on blood tests. How do you measure fat deficiency? You can't. Well, I think, Rob, you know, my biggest concern really, and, and I really try to toe the line and try to just be uh, uh, diplomatic, but... My biggest concern, even looking at Twitter, looking at some of the Alpers, uh, other than Tro, uh, most of the, the keto people are pretty tame. Uh, but some of these vegan guys, I'm, I'm telling you, the tweets they put out, like when, when um, you know, they're, they're hoping that Sean Baker's family all dies of heart attacks. I hope I'll be the one to intubate you. Uh, you know, just bad stuff they've said to a lot of people who've had misfortune and they go, this is what you get, you know, because you're eating animals. And, and that's not a natural reaction. There's people I don't agree with, but I don't attack them when they're going through a hard time or personally. And, you know, I, I don't think that's human nature to be that cruel and mean. Um, and I think there are some deficiencies. There, there are people that we don't have to name on Twitter that, you know, I think they're having mental breakdowns, really, the way they attack people and they're, they're super nasty. Uh, you know, there's got to be something to that. And it's generally in the hardcore vegans. There's a lot of vegans. who I, I just had a great conversation with a vegan today that's super cool, super nice. She does her thing. Do you do your thing? I, you know, peace to everyone type thing. Um, so, but I've talked to enough people. I did a podcast this morning. She said she was vegan and she started, you know, losing it and feeling weak and tired and having mental stuff going on. She ate she insists on eating a steak and she was better the next day, right? So maybe it's placebo, maybe whatever. But I do think there's something, um, you know, Georgia E talks about this. A lot of people are talking about it with choline deficiency, different minerals that, that help calm the nerves or whatever it might be. But that being said, I think that that is a topic I would love to have you back on and we can kind of talk about all that stuff. I have to go to a wedding. I, have a tie. I wasn't wearing a tie just for you, Rob. <laughs> Although I, I should every time you come on because it's such an honor having you. Um, you know, everything you're doing... I, I'm so excited about people getting to know who you are. I mean, I think you are the face of low carb. I really do. I think you're the guy who you're forceful, you're reasonable, you know what the heck you're talking about. You better be confident to, to take a stand like you do. And you go, yes, this is what it is. And it's factual, respectful. Um, this is what we have to do. We have to have people like you uh, intro on the front lines who say, look, guys, you know, here, here's my experience. It, the more experience we have, the more people we have doing this stuff. Uh, the more credibility we have. And I think it's, it's, it's critical. I mean, we all kind of have our own little niche of what we want to do. And, and some people have to be up on the front lines. And I think you and Tro are, are, are two of them that, you know, I'm proud of. I, I love your approach and, and having wisdom and having uh, knowledge to back up what you're saying. If you just say stuff because you want to say it because you believe it, it's different than here's what we're seeing clinically and this is what we're doing. I think that's powerful. And I really appreciate that, Brian. Thank you very much. And I think the critical thing, just I know you've got to go, but the critical thing is everything that we do, that Tro and I and you do, is directly measurable. I can measure the numbers and see the improvement, and we do. So uh, to quote Eric Westman, I do this a lot to my patients. 
if you do it, it will work. And it working is measurable. It's measurable on the scale. It's measurable in your blood work. And it's even measurable in some of the difficult to quantify things like self-esteem, self-confidence, mental health. And preventing disease is so much more difficult to measure than treating disease. And, and, you know, so everyone talks about how do you treat an autistic child? Well, a ketogenic diet is great for autistic children. Yeah, maybe. But the ketogenic diet prevents autism. And yet we can't, it's so, you can't do that study. You can't quantify it. But if you go down and you look at the biology of how the brain forms, it's logical that eating fat makes a difference and eating carbohydrates harms you. So you and I and, and Tro are doing things that is measurable. And if you do it, it works. And I really, really thank, the, thank you for the opportunity. I try to stay away from the emotional stuff. I'm very emotional myself, but I try to stay on the biologically explainable pathway. And then I don't need beliefs because I have evidence. Wow, man, that amen. is, yeah, amen. What do you say, Tro? You want to close this in prayer? <laughs> No, I mean, everything, everything here, uh, absolutely, just, just uh, you're preaching to the choir. You're preaching to the choir. This is, needs to be said, needs to be heard, and we need a lot of different people saying a lot of different things, a lot of different approaches coming together, you know, low carb and, and the Verdas and the IDMs and the, you know, uh, Dr. Sivas and Dr. Lenskis and Assad and, you know, all these people kind of helping out and putting their own uh, research and their own uh, clinical experiments experience out there so that we all learn i mean this is this is a community and uh we're advancing medicine i really believe that yeah and i think it's a puzzle and we all do our little you know you get the edges done and then you start filling in the gaps in the in, in the middle then all of a sudden you have a big picture and you say wow you step back and say that that that's a big picture right that's done so you know rob again thank you you're always on the forefront it's always hard having you on rob you know the the, the, the problem i have is like we we're at low carb san diego true you weren't there so you missed out on this but He's talking about autism one day. And the next day, he's talking about sports performance. And he knows all this stuff. And he's a surgeon. He's, he doesn't stay in his own lane. He comes over here and then just thrashes us. And we all sit there and say, wow, this guy's super smart. So you know, no, you know, a Brian, lot of respect. Human biology is one lane. Human biology is one lane. <laughs> yeah, we agree. We agree. It's like, hey, come on. If you know more than I do, come in my lane and teach us, right? That's how we all yeah, feel. And that's yeah, how we're all going to yeah. learn from each other. We say, hey, you're a surgeon. You don't talk, you know, Fedke, you're a surgeon. You can't talk nutrition. That's such garbage. When he's helping people and reversing diabetes, that, that's where we get heated up because, uh, yeah. uh, you know. You know who my professor of human biology was? Of physiology. Just to come full circle, you know who my professor of physiology was at medical school? It was Tim William, Noakes, right? William Oslo. Tim Noakes. Tim Noakes, the <laughs> well, godfather yeah. of understanding yeah. human biology. <laughs> Yeah, hey, you know what? If we can't get Noakes on, we're going to have you just be an imposter. No one will know. Yeah. <laughs> when you, you were talking about that. Is that Noakes? <laughs> yeah, I mean, literally, Tim Noakes taught me how to think. Yeah, that's the point. And that's one thing. I just want to end on this point. Look, we have a lot of med students who haven't seen a patient. They may be as brilliant as they can be. But when you have someone who's been doing this for as many years as all these guys have, they have clinical experience. They've worked with patients. There's one thing about reading about driving, and then you have to get behind the wheel. And it's a lot different. It's a lot different. So show the respect. I mean, I've seen the disrespect that has been shown to these docs who have looked at it and can explain where they're coming from. But if you don't understand physiology and you go on your fence and you, you start throwing stones, oh, it's, it's, it's going to hurt you. It's going to bite you. This is a, a word of warning to those med students. There's so many great ones coming up that get it, but there's some that just don't have the respect and that's, it's not a good thing. Trust me. We, we were all residents and chief residents. We all kind of saw who struggled and who got in, in trouble and, and uh, did bad stuff. It's the arrogant SOBs that come in and think they know it all, right? You own the world and you're God, the God complex stuff. And I think we're done with that. We all can learn from each other. And that's what we're doing here. That This is what, you know, you're going to take nuggets. We're all going to learn stuff from each other. And it's super awesome. So my wife's leaving me, guys. I got to okay, go. No, good luck. Be God bless you, man. Thank you. Thank you so are. much, Rob. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank take you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Low Carb MD Podcast. We hope you learned something of value today. Please remember to subscribe and rate us on iTunes and Stitcher, as this will help us to get the word out. Please consider supporting this project through a small donation through Patreon. Every penny helps. Until next time.